let's let's get started uh, good afternoon everyone and uh, good evening or good morning depending on where you're from uh, my name is varun malik i'm the ceo of a new age consulting firm called consolidon uh, consolidon is new age in the sense that we don't uh, follow the traditional consulting model in which they hire a lot of consultants and then grow their firm and deliver projects what we did instead was partnered with a lot of boutique consulting firms uh, more than 300 boutique consulting firms and what allow this allowed us to do was grow very quickly uh, we were about 500 consultants by the end of 2000 so we started in 2017 and by the end of 2019 we were about 500 consultants we delivered over 200 projects in those first 3 years um, so Connected Insights is a web summit that we've uh, that we've introduced uh, last week. It's a one week of webinars and panel discussions that we're doing uh, to pass on, uh, you know, expertise, knowledge from the boutique consulting firms in our ecosystem uh, to people like yourself who are interested in uh, learning more about uh, the practice areas that our boutique consulting firms work in. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, today's discussion is being led by Prequate, uh, which is a boutique firm in our ecosystem. So Karan is going to be speaking about uh, are you m &A ready? Uh, feel free to interact. Uh, it's a short and cozy session, as you can see, about 20, 25 attendees. Uh, so please uh, feel free to interact. We've all made you panelists rather than attendees so that you can uh, Unmute yourself, switch on your videos, ask questions during the discussion or after the presentation. Uh, you can also use the chat feature to ask any questions. Uh, finally, look out for the giveaways. There will be some giveaways from our team on the chat uh, uh, chat option. Uh, so do look, uh, look out for those. We're looking out for speakers for the next version of Connected Insights. Next connected insights we're giving away uh, passes for some very interesting workshops that we're doing in the evenings during the summit so do look out for those uh, so without further ado i will ask karan to get started on his presentation looking forward karan yeah, thanks thanks for warming up the crowd for me uh, so quickly just uh, sharing my presentation to you guys Yeah, so uh, let's get started. For, first of all, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and uh, good morning or good evening for people joining from different parts of the world. Uh, first of all, appreciate you guys taking your time off. I know uh, you would have had a long week and would be looking to unwind, but uh, hope the session adds value to you and uh, gives you something to ponder upon over the weekend. Uh, and if at any point of time during the session, like Warren just mentioned, uh, if you have any specific questions for me, please please feel free to drop uh, those questions in the chat box. I will I will take them at the end of the presentation, or I will be happy to connect it uh, personally to address that. All right. So let's get into it then. So are you M and A ready? Right. So one of the biggest questions that uh, that the businesses uh, today ask us uh, around these four three uh, four key aspects. One is is it the right time now? considering what has happened across the world, is it, is it really the right time to get into one or should we wait out for economies to recover? Does it really make sense for you? That, as in, are you at the right juncture to make that decision today? Or when is the right time to make it? And next, how do you start preparing for one? That is like, you know, what are the nitty gritties that it is involved from both buy side and the sell side as well? And the last aspect is some, some, some tips as to how to make uh, M&A successful from a personal experience uh, why m and failed. So trying to address those aspects to, that you can keep in mind. Uh, so that will help you in terms of uh, addressing uh, how to how to become more successful. 
So let's get into the first uh, aspect then. Uh, is it the right time? Con considering a COVID hit here, m &A was definitely steady in 2020 as compared to uh, 2019. Like you might see a lot of spikes in the graph and everything, but if you see the pent up demand got compensated in the second half of the year, so uh, most most likely it is uh, it is almost in 2019 11. But what is different this year is definitely the core constituents of the deal itself, right? So it has changed slightly as to what it was in 2019. Uh, if this was majorly due to the increasing risk factors where the company's uh, valuations were, were lowered down because of the fact that risk factors increasing, we'll obviously reduce the valuation because more risk, meaning more reward is affected by any investment. Uh, so it became very attractive to the buy side. And the other, the other key factors that was the companies performed a lot of realignment and reorganization uh, assessments to ensure faster recovery from the crisis. So this has triggered a great deal, uh, or I would say a great a new wave uh, for MA uh, uh, in 2020. So, but does, this doesn't necessarily need to hold right in 2021, right? So how, how are the people at the top perceiving MA and in for the next uh, year or the next 24 months, I would like to say, 54% of senior executives from MENA region are actively looking to pursue MA in the next 12 months. And just considering two key geographies in the region, that being UAE and Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, 56% and 57% of uh, executives feel MA will be a crucial factor in the next two years. They believe that acquisition will put them in the right path for recovery and build resilience, resilience for future uncertainties. Now, coming to the APAC region, which is, uh, uh, which is one of the largest regions and more opportunities growing of late, uh, Executives are far more confident about the way they handle COVID with two thirds of senior executives feel that they were able to manage operational stability quite well as compared to the rest of the world. So this has fueled a great sense of, sense of optimism in the region with 53% of executives wanting to pursue MBA, m &A in the uh, in the next year. If you see that this these two regions are, are slightly more optimistic in the MA uh, scenario as compared to the rest of the world, where the rest of the world average is standard 49%. Uh, and the majorly uh, APAC is considered as one of the highest uh, growing potential area, specifically Southeast Asia, India, and Australia have great potential to uh, the top three area uh, regions, I would say, to that will that'll be a hotspot for growth and opportunities in the next three years. But what, I see, what we see is one thing common across these two regions is the realizations that they've had, right? So these realizations were in three key areas. One is strengthening the supply chain for better control and better, better visibility of their entire uh, value chain. Uh, digital transformation in terms of strategizing their businesses, their premise as well, because the consumer behaviors are changing. The, uh, and also they have to tweak their go-to-market strategies along with that as well. And finally, rebalancing the portfolio. Now companies who believe that they have the best of the product, they're growing quite significantly. Once hit by COVID, they had to rethink their product portfolio. They have to diversify the product lines in order to, in order to better have, have you know, diversify the risk so that you, know, you are well positioned in uncertain times. So this is how uh, the, uh, the, the region, uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, the region indicators, uh, the, the business, the leaders at the top are indicating their intent towards m and But what, what will drive, what will enable m and in 2020 is the fact that all of these entities are sitting on $7.6 trillion of liquid fund, yielding a record low income interest rates. So these are ready to be deployed in more and more efficient assets to yield better returns. So they are they want to deploy it on three key areas. One is obviously in investing in their skill set, resources, and technology to plug in the short term and long term gaps. Uh, and also the second part is with the trifecta confidence. That is the investors, the CXOs, and the consumers having uh, put in more trust on newer companies and on their existing businesses. Businesses will start getting more aggressive in terms of approaching the market. So they will try to ramp up very quickly. And also reorganization events like consolidation and distress uh, acquisitions are one of the key things that, that are bound to happen during uncertain times. Now, uh, you, might, you might feel is downturn the right time itself uh, to make an investment or is it a good time to enter now? Let's see what how historically investments in downturn have uh, yielded. So in terms of volumes and value, we see uh, 
we see that the volumes, the value has dropped by 47% and the, the volumes have uh, dropped by 12%. So by downturn, I mean uh, your financial shocks and also your epidemics, right? So financial shocks, meaning a subprime crisis, your dot-com bubble uh, crash, or epidemics such as Spanish flu, Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, HRV, SARS, so go on, the list goes on. So the, like I said, the deal, the real value has dropped by 47% and the volume has increased, uh, has dropped by 12% because com companies consider liquidity as an essential element for survival uh, at this time, or the valuations don't meet expectations for companies to get into a transaction. Financing is hard because everybody wants liquidity and companies will be focused more on internal uh, realignment and restructuring, which is why they would have pulled out a lot of deals or pushed the deals uh, further and things like that. But when you see the three year shareholders return during investments made during downturns, the yield has been far, far greater than, uh, uh, than usual, right? So the, uh, it, is, it is generally on the higher side, uh, at 22% considering both epidemic and uh, financial shocks. But just considering epidemic investment itself, it is it has given a 30% three-year share loss return. And this is higher than the individual sector averages that, that you can benchmark with your S&P 500. So investing in, in downturn is not exactly a bad idea. And historically speaking, with these numbers, you can see that companies have uh, yielded better returns, right? But COVID is unprecedented, right? COVID, COVID is something which has never happened in the past. In fact, pandemic situation is, is, uh, was not foreseen by, by the entire world. So this has shaken the fundamentals of, both, uh, of most businesses across the world, where consumers behavior, consumer behavior has changed drastically. Their choices, the way they pay, uh, and even, even what they spend on, right? So the discretionary and non-discretionary items is now is being a very important factor before consumer make a purchase decision. Also the supply chain. Companies want to have better controls over the value, better control over the value chain and also optimize operations. So how to manage, uh, better manage their external partners and so on has become very important. And also the market strategy. Reevaluate the existing portfolio and market strategy, like I said earlier, consider risk diversification, alternate go-to market strategies, where you see a lot of companies, a lot of small businesses are trying to go online, a lot of automotive companies are trying to go, uh, have low touch technology in build. Some companies are trying to diversify the risk, add in more technology. So a major realignment in strategy itself is happening. So this, I would say, has created an opportunity, an opportunity for m and In other terms, it, it is a necessity for companies to do it even more now. One, to definitely reposition and recover uh, faster in, from the existing pandemic and also ensure that you have, uh, you, you have the specific requirement for the future uncertainties if it, if it comes uh, up. And also assess and plug in the short-term gaps that is there in the company and be a part of early consolidation industry. Rather than fighting with the competition, you can do much more when you, when you tie up with them, right? So introducing an alternate revenue channels, uh, let's say banking uh, takes over FinTech to ensure that you know, they have some alternate revenue channels and better data captured to understand the consumers much better. So this definitely uh, downturns, definitely create more opportunity in terms of how the uh, uh, opportunity itself comes comes rise. So right now, more than ROI, the need is fundamental realignment. So this brings in uh, brings to the point as to uh, why which sectors are actually doing well uh, right now. Coming to the consumer market, uh, we see a lot of e-commerce companies adding essential goods as part of their offering during COVID. Health and well-being is because people are getting more uh, conscious about what they eat. Uh, their fitness, leisure and entertainment because people had uh, more time to spend, so they this they used to stream a lot. And you see a lot of a uh, lot of a uh, lot of these broadcasting networks are trying to shift to a more app-based and OTT kind of uh, approach to make it more uh, uh, value-driven for them. But one thing that we see off late, which is very prominent, is the factor of ESG. So environmental, social, and governance uh, factor that is being uh, considered as one of the key indicators for any uh, any sort of uh, uh, investment that has been happening. So coming to healthcare sector, uh, uh, cell gene therapy, oncology is attracting great interest from big pharmaceutical companies. Uh, consolidation indicators are uh, 
uh, are shown in device manufacturing areas across, let's say, therapeutic areas like dental, general surgery, orthopedic, innovative drug development technologies, mRNA, the, the, the method that was used to develop the COVID vaccine, and telemedicine and personal healthcare technologies, which is trying to shift from to a more consumer-driven approach for healthcare itself. Coming to the TMT area, due to accelerated adoption of tech, digital payments and online shopping during the pandemic itself has given as in fact, accelerated the pre-existing trend, uh, where a lot of lot of uh, these small businesses are moving digital, and a lot of fintechs are being acquired by the banks, which is giving more rise to IT security. So, if you can see how these three uh, top three areas, top two areas, are interlinked to each each other's growth, and gaming, obviously, uh, you, you all must have heard the Nazara IPO, uh, Nazara Technology IPO that is coming up, great acquisition spree in the last two years, and right now they're they're hitting their IPO uh, target, which is which is really great. So tech and media is is doing fantastic. Coming to the automotive uh, aspect now, uh, what happened, what is happening is before it was a more uh, personal face to face approach where you send a lot of people to get in more work and everything. Now companies are trying to implement low touch technology into their uh, product itself. So we have one of uh, one of the exciting startups that we work with. Uh, so is installing a kind of device into two wheeler itself. So this device not only tracks and gives some additional functionality to the consumers, but also ensures that the company can trigger maintenance activities, can trigger a uh, lot of other services uh, that the business can provide and where consumers are, are reached out at every uh, at a shorter span of time. So manufacturing and automotive is moving into that kind of uh, approach in terms of the go to market. To summarize uh, this section, MA last year was really stable and it has a promising year ahead. And yes, it's the right time, or rather, it's, it is as attractive as always. But just because I mentioned these four key areas uh, as a great traction area, in the last in the last year, in fact, 80% of the project that uh, we have, the mandates that we have taken up are outside of these areas. So if you are if you are belonging to any, if you're not belonging to any of these. Uh, sectors, then you you still uh, uh, not lost of opportunity. Right, there's ample opportunity. There's integrations happening everywhere. So now coming to the next next aspect to it as well. So how deals happen? So to simplify this, I will explain this in three scenarios from the position uh, of approach or the position of placement of a company itself. So. I'll categorize into three segments. One is position of strength, where would you see the green tick, uh, the green up arrow, and the position of win-win situation and the position of weakness. So from coming from a position of strength, let's say you're on the buy side of the transaction. So you will you will be in the position of strength if your target, if if you have a target and the target is in distress. So like I said, this last year, a lot of valuations uh, were marked lower because uh, you know, the, the risk factors went up, so the valuation expectations had to come down. So that that is approaching a position of strength. But let's say if you are on the sell side, then you have done a lot of things right. You are in the right time at the right point for to be a very valuable uh, investment for anybody that wants to acquire you. Now, win-win situation is both are doing well, and you you can create a much uh, better synergy in when when you when you tag along with each other and create more value. Weakness standpoint, uh, for if you're on the buy side, then if you feel that you have to eliminate a competition that is that you feel is a threat to you, uh, even this happens even for a larger uh, largest companies in the world, right? So even though they have a predominant uh, position in the industry, they would still want to eliminate some competition based on some kind of indicators that they feel. So that at that stage, I would call a weakness from a buy side, and from the sell side, like I said, if you're in distress or if you if you want to uh, be acquired to be to survive itself. So there you will be on the back foot. So it is very important to position your company from a strength point, if not at least a, a win-win scenario. Now let's take a look at some, some of the examples uh, on, on, this, on this front. First, from the position of strength. Uh, from the buy side angle to it, I would Tata Motors acquiring Jaguar Land Rover is a great example. So JLR, which was earlier part of Ford Group, was taken over by Tata Motors. And I'm sure uh, this comes a lot to us that uh, they say the acquisition happened uh, because uh, there, there's, there's a rumor about a sweet revenge that uh, Ratan Tata took for some past incident uh, uh, by Ford. But here's what, what I see of the deal. JLR was in financial distress, uh, or I would say stress. So Tata Motors, who were known to make uh, cars for affordable segment, acquired JLR. 
it might not uh, be a right fitment at that point of time. Like a lot of people would say, you know, it's just a, a luxury uh, uh, line added to it. People don't see that value. They have positioned something else. The, they are quite a completely, un completely unrelated segment. But it was not just including a luxury brand to the portfolio, right? So when Tata, Tata found value is the design and engineering capabilities of GLR. So this was a long-term plan of Tata to reposition themselves uh, by not just as car, affordable car makers, but also a premium looking affordable car segment. So they have an operational uh, strong suit and with the, with the design and engineering expertise of JLR, now Tata is confidently positioned itself along with let's say brands like Kia, uh, Morris Garages, Toyota, and have man managed to sell more cars than ever before. So right now it was uh, a great deal from a buy side perspective for Tata. Uh, from the sell side, we can. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples, and I'm sure there's a lot of uh, a lot of issues or backlashes against White Hat Junior. But here's why White Hat Junior is by far, according to me at least, is one of the most efficient startup. I would I would say. So Baidu's one of the world's most valuable edtech acquired White Hat Junior for three million dollars all cash deal. So this is a very rare incident that we come across in M&A. Where usually m and they say that, you know, we'll pay 30% now and, and the rest based on some kind of a uh, milestone uh, that the rest to be achieved. But here's how White Hat Junior checked all the boxes as an asset for Baichu's. So White Hat Junior achieved operational cash flow positive within just 15 months of operations. And this is by just raising $11 million, which a lot of other companies are trying to spend billions of dollars to just hit that point. So, and White Hat Junior was gaining great traction and, and their innovation in the platform itself. So Baiju's had two things to uh, choose. Either I build and burn to uh, compete with White Hat or I just acquire them and add to my portfolio where I can build further to it. So, and also the, the last thing and the most crucial aspect which I feel here is the timing. So during the acquisition or a few months before that, the government released the national education policy. So this placed a far greater emphasis on digital learning at early stages itself. And Whitehead Junior was in a very sweet spot to be acquired. And Baidu's made an acquisition and that resulted in a $300 million all cash deal. Like I would stress all cash deal. It's a great sign for any acquisition to happen. The next side, which is a win-win scenario. So, so Google acquiring YouTube. So we all have heard uh, Google, uh, YouTube being a very good uh, portfolio of companies for uh, uh, Google. So Google paid $1.6 billion to acquire YouTube 15 years ago. So if you do a time value based study and all of that, it will be far, far more uh, valuable uh, today. But it was, the investment was made back then was when, in, when internet was expensive, was kind of expensive for the consumer, for the mass consumers itself. But Google believed that the content consumption will evolve over time and in coming year. And they even tried to launch their own platform that is called Google videos, but they felt YouTube had a far more superior platform as compared to their own product itself. So they took that bet. So fast forward 15 years down the line, today YouTube generates 10 times more revenue every year with just YouTube's ad revenue, right? So it is a great, uh, why generator for Google and a clear example of how forward look forward thinking into the industry will give you a long term benefit uh, for the company itself. Uh, just now, uh, one of the recent transactions which I came across uh, this week was Drop Dropbox acquiring Doxin. So uh, both fantastic companies. I mean, we use uh, similar products. Uh, Doxin we use very frequently, and Dropbox maybe use is an alternative, but. Dropbox, uh, the core vision itself, right? So Dropbox wants to make content sharing more easy and secure. But Doxin, on the other hand, adds more value to the content sharing itself with personalized sharing functionality, providing data-driven insights and better access to the information shared itself. So in simple terms, Dropbox made information sharing easy and Doxin completed the circle. So this integration itself, so after uh, the acquisition made, so now if you can join these two visions together, if you see for Dropbox, it made a lot of sense uh, because Docsend added more value to their existing uh, customer base itself because they see Docsend performing really well. So getting into a, a transaction with them will give a far more uh, better outcome as compared to 
uh, like you know any other company acquisition. So this integration will definitely result in a positive customer value itself. As in, like I said, we use an alternative to Dropbox, but uh, who knows? We might just uh, switch to uh, Dropbox because the extended fun functionality of Docsit. So like me, there are millions of people who might just think that, and that itself is a big boost to your ROI. Uh, so now coming from a weakness standpoint, so this uh, this is like uh, one of the very surprising uh, cases that I've read uh, all, all around is Coca-Cola, a global giant, wanted to acquire a market share in India. So what they did was enter India, uh, start exploring tier one cities that they managed to get in, uh, make a fair headway uh, through them. But when they're trying to penetrate tier two and tier three cities, that is where they found uh, thumbs up to be impenetrable. So they, they had bigger, uh, Coca-Cola had a much bigger budget in terms of acquiring customers, but still consumers preferred thumbs up over Coca-Cola in this particular region. But let's say, uh, so the Coca-Cola, what they decided to do is let's say we acquire, they acquired thumbs up. And even till date from personal experience, uh, thumbs up rules uh, a lot of uh, Indian market, especially in tier two and tier three, they're rock solid. Any new company entering entering the country will have to take up a fight with thumbs up, uh, which is uh, which is literally next to impossible. Now, for my last example, I thought I'll include a very uh, regional favorite uh, case here, which is Formula One. I know uh, Formula One is widely followed in the Middle East. So, Formula One, as we all know, Sahara Force India, the, one of the first Indian team to make it to the Formula One championship. So, this team uh, was struggling hard to raise uh, sponsorships or meet their cash flow. So they were into multiple other problems with the management itself, itself, right? And we know how important sponsorship is to an F1 team. And Sahara Force India was almost in the verge of shutting down. So enter BWD Racing Point, where uh, Lawrence Stroll, a Canadian billionaire, invested in the team. Though as per sources, the objective was to ensure uh, a seat for his son, Lance Stroll, in the team. But uh, undoubtedly, if you see from purely a business standpoint, this is a clear example where a company was in distress and a BWT Racing Point took that opportunity to acquire the company. So if you see uh, with these examples, what I'm trying to emphasize is on the, in the aspect that, you know, whether you are on the buy side or the sell side, the way you position your company is key and getting into a deal with, with great value to the other party or at least a win-win synergy is always the right way to approach a business. So with that, I will say, so how, how would you, how would you prepare for an MA? Just excuse me for a second. So uh, how do, how do one prepare for an MA, right? So let's say this is your typical business curve. I mean, there are some companies who probably break the learning curve, be hit from day one, but I would say this is a, a place where most businesses would undergo uh, one way or the other. From an MA standpoint, your positioning strategy should be different at each of these stages, simply because your value on, di on different aspects, you're valued on different aspects at each of these stages. So in my experience, we have seen a lot of companies, uh, opportunities for MA and a lot of companies are bought and sold during their early stages. In fact, there are some companies that who are building technology just to be acquired by one, one specific player and they know they're solving a key problem for them. So regardless of any stage that you that you belong to, tailoring your communication holds the key, right? At early stages, the value of the business is not profitability. It is the IP. It is what business model that you're approaching it from. What is the relevance of the problem that you're solving and how synergies can be created. So that should be the core thesis of a deal. Uh, and in stage two and stage three is, is one of the most lucrative uh, places for a company to be bought because simply because you are a growing, you are a growing company, and your growth is in double digits. And this would also indicate a great ROI for the buy side as well. So they, so here it goes hand in hand, where companies feel that it's the right time to acquire a company before they hit maturity. Because once, once you hit maturity, then they'll start valuing you based on what is the cost of replacement. So can I do it grounds up instead of paying such a high premium, or is it is it worthy enough to uh, be acquired itself? But still, uh, during a material maturity stage, companies are bought and sold, but mainly from a consolidation standpoint or entering a new market or entering or getting into partnership, joint ventures, and so on and so forth. But 
coming from uh, like like i said when when the weakness point in the sell side is when the company is distress is in distress and uh, during distress as well there is a lot of companies being bought and sold especially during pandemic there are there are companies although they're positioned in the strength but from the other side it's in their incentives to always say that you know times are bad and you are in distress the your sales have dropped last year so i won't give you the valuation that you want so distress is one of the places where if you're on the sell side stay away uh, or liquidate before you enter that stage itself so and uh, of course like uh, like i said the tata jlr example is a pure is a is a clear uh, example how distress happens so now you you are you know fairly where you are placed if you're on the sell side you know where the company is positioned today but on from the buy side as well you they probably if you have targets in mind uh, but that you want to acquire you know where the target is positioned today so how do you prepare for an mna itself so how do you build up for an mna so i'll just uh, talk about from the buy side perspective uh, so let's zoom out 30000 feet view from your company today so let's say this is your core vision for the company where you started off today and this is the and you have a long term vision that you have uh that long term vision can be 10 years 20 years for some companies long term vision can be 5 years as well so what i'm trying to say is this this long term vision should be backed by a pure industry research because you're in you're in the industry you know where the industry is headed towards like how google thought content consumption will move to a more uh, video uh, video driven so they they did that research and uh, they did a long term road road map for it and they also have or uh, investment strategies in place so your long term vision can be broken down into smaller strategic targets because you know you, if you if you go with the longer term plan itself then you won't have time for course course correction so uh, let's say let's take google and youtube for simplicity sake here so google's vision and i'm quoting provide an important service to the world instantly delivering relevant information virtually on any topic and their mission organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful so they have this thesis built around the market uh, from day one right so their long term roadmap is to achieve that and they have broken down those goals into shorter targets and let's say google organizing the entire world's information on their search engine was their first uh, growth plan then they felt uh, no the content consumption will will grow rapidly in terms of uh, like you know video more visual driven approach let's say that was their stage 2 so in stage 2 what they would have done is they would have let's say plan what is to be done and all of that then then they will take stock of what their people are what the people resources are and what the money time how much money they have to spend and how much time do they have to hit the market so although google had uh, this the resources and the bandwidth to do all of this so they chose the organic road to do that and they try to develop uh, google videos and we like we like i said like i mentioned before google failed miserably while doing that as they found youtube to be far more superior than what they built themselves so youtube was acquired by google and uh, so that you know how it led 10 times more revenue today and all of that but in modern times you might not have the flexibility like google itself right because speed is key and trend cycles are far more shorter than what it was before so you can't afford to try and fail because more likely somebody else will beat you to market or if you are slow to do that you have to constantly keep catching up to your competition so building organically it has its own uh, advantages that you have better control you have better grip towards what is doing you have fair visibility when you want to complete when you want to hit market but what uh, inorganic growth or mna i would say would give you that uh, that speed in terms of the learning curve itself so you can skip the learning curve if you if you do it right so identify a good target ensure that they fit right into your core vision and integrate and deploy and then build after that so that gives you a far more uh, uh, more speed to the business itself and saves you a lot of time in terms of learning trying testing and failing so from from the buy side point of view although just uh, although organic gives you more control mna gives you definitely speed probably even better roi like in case of google so but what is important in in this process itself right because mna has its own uh, flaws and everything it is important 
to have your core vision in line. It's not just any business that you want to acquire. You want to acquire a business that fit well into your either vertical integration, your horizontal integration, fill in a particular gap in the company, or this is where the industry is headed towards. If, if that core vision, uh, if any asset that you're trying to evaluate is outside this core vision, then you, you don't need to, you have to definitely pass that opportunity itself, no matter how lucrative or how attractive, attractive the valuation itself is. Now, uh, that is from the buy side. Now, let's talk from the sell side to it, right? Uh, in my opinion, uh, I'm, I've just mentioned 24 months here uh, because I feel 24 time, months is a good time to meticulously plan and execute an MA. But there were mandates where we have executed in less than a year and sometimes less than six months. So uh, that way, the time really is not uh, the crucial uh, part where you think about it. It's all about execution, how you execute and who executes it. For some companies, uh, they have a team carved out to do it where they lose focus on the operations and everything. But if you have a dedicated team outsourced, then they can do it much faster because they, they have done it multiple number of times and they can do it uh, and they know how to do it and what things to keep in mind. And again, like I said, there's no uh, uh, learning curve that is required from your end and they easily fit in into the uh, loop immediately. So what I would recommend is set a target date and work backwards that it can be in your early stages, your stage one, stage two, or stage three, like I mentioned in one of my previous slides. So set a, set a target date that this is where the stage two is where I want to uh, consider opportunities for m &A itself. So uh, this m and need, need not be your first choice. Like, like a lot of companies dream, IPO is their first choice uh, to liquidate, but m and is definitely uh, need not be ruled out and it's a great plan B because you are given value for what, what you truly are and it's not driven by sentiments and emotions. So in fact, one of our, uh, like I mentioned, one of our clients in the EdTech is actually developing a software just to be acquired. Uh, so they have even pre-revenue companies uh, have a strategy to be acquired. So, uh, and also m &A can be a great sign if, if you have, uh, if, your, if your market is showing uh, signs of consolidation and all of that. So always, what I would say is always have your plan A, where plan A can obviously be your IPO, but definitely plan A, A version two or plan B can be your uh, MA itself, right? And once, once, you, once you draw this roadmap out, clearly communicate to your stakeholders. This is by far one of the most, the uh, biggest roadblock that we see is the existing stakeholders are not informed about the opportunity that has uh, come up or uh, they, they would not say this was the intention that we that we built the company out for. So a clear misalignment at that stage would create a lot of roadblocks and you might just miss out on the opportunity. So getting your stakeholders to buy in to your vision or to your uh, to your plan in the next two years, three years or a liquidity event is key, not only for the existing investors, but also to your upcoming investors. If you plan to raise another round, clearly communicate to them that this is what I'm doing because that will set the benchmark and uh, a trust if you for the future as well. So this is what you should be clearly focusing on the initial part of your evaluation step itself. Now coming to the aspect of uh, the next the next phase to it itself, right? So you need to ensure that what are you valuable for. So this can, like I said, in different stages you're valued for different for, for different reasons. And at every at whenever you make this choice of uh, like you know build a roadmap for an acquisition have the plan in place. So say that you are valuable for ABC reasons, and this is why I'm good at, because I might be generating far greater traction. I might be acquiring customers at half the price in the competition. I am, I am having a lot of dwell time or one of my LOBs is doing great. So, so that LOB itself can be spun out and be acquired or, or things like that. So have the matrices defined for each of these, uh, uh, each of these key strengths of your business and it should be stage relevant and industry relevant so you cannot say EBITDA gross margin for everything for manufacturing EBITDA direct cost uh, EBITDA might be a great indicator but for technology companies for services companies it your MRRs your recurring revenue your churn your uh, uh, what do you say your upsell cross sell ratios can be far more important right so also one of the key developments of recent times is not just tracking your financial metrics, it's also tracking your non-financial metrics. One of the clear uh, reasons that I said is also a popular thing uh, of late is ESG. So ESG talks about how your company is benchmarked towards uh, other so environmental and social impact where 
you are you are weighed upon uh, from an investment standpoint as to how you, how well you are doing back to the ecosystem what are the uncertainties that you can handle you cannot handle so have all of these things covered when you are tracking your company in terms of value because this will give you a far better visibility in terms of how to position yourself say that this is why i'm good at so you can classify yourself as a win win uh, position or in the uh, in the strength position then uh, then this i would say which most companies don't follow but it's a great practice to do is start getting noticed by a potential acquirer so now now you now that you've made a choice that this is my strategy it's as early as possible start getting noticed uh, by your competitors like if it's a coffee shop then start setting up places uh, where you, where your competitors can see you so show them that you are far more capable or you're equally capable of getting the market as as well uh, as them and also uh, the best deals the relationships that happen is through a purchase order like you can work closely with them you can initially start off as a vendor for them and prove your prove your uh, performance by showing how ethical you are how 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 uh, how you deliver on promises that you make and also this gives you an understanding to what the what the uh, potential acquirers company is all about like their culture their management style the way they honor their uh, promises or it can be anything of those any soft or financial aspects to it you'll get a fair bit of idea while you build that relationship but uh, like i said this is a least followed uh, practice uh, because whenever a company comes uh, whenever a mandate comes to us we always uh, start recommend we have, the first thing that we ask is how well have you built relationship are you getting noticed uh, by your uh, potential targets or not but that's okay because most uh, uh, companies are not doing uh, what 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 is ideal but let's say they bump into uh, opportunity or or while playing golf somewhere they they found they came across an opportunity where they they start discussing and one thing leads to another and then they'll get to know that okay there's there is a good fitment here so uh, even that is a good relationship uh, that is there but ensure that no matter how you start building a relationship start keeping the relationship warm don't lose touch don't lose touch don't lose connect try to play place more emphasis on the quality or the experience that you give to them next uh coming to the last coming to uh, the last aspect of a background prep itself right so once you know identify a couple of uh, potential acquirers for yourself try to shortlist them based on the factors that i mentioned about like you know they might fit great into your company like docsend might have been a, a customer where they were they giving an api support to dropbox for the previous clients so then they found to found it to be a great value so they 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 want to continue the relationship so once you shortlist your potential acquirers then start reaching out slowly with an intent that you know that there's a deal on the table and show them that intent that you know you're looking for something to expand you're looking for some help or you you trying to possibly explore some other opportunity with you uh, so on those lines so they get an intent and they start thinking about an opportunity as well so now you've done all the things that you need to start off start getting your relationship warm and everything so while you're doing that you should also ensure that internally the hygiene of your documentation your compliances and all other aspects be it your process your efficiency your profitability your business tracking everything is in line so mock due diligence is something which is definitely going to happen uh, during an m and a activity you should ensure that these due diligence are done internally beforehand as well so try and get a best uh, unbiased view about the whole status quo of your company excuse me today and make sure that you are in top condition there is no surprises that unfold when you're actually in, in the process of due diligence because that is something which uh, always comes to light when we are getting the money that they'll say hey we didn't know uh, this was important so we never got it covered but then we'll have to, we have to, we have to do a lot of uh, thing around to see how we can best show coat it but what would be ideal is uh, do a thorough check uh, of your internal uh, internal status and uh, definitely please uh, try if not if you're looking for an external help on this uh, your accountant might not be the right person because they are specialized and they 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 hardwired to think in a post facto way and they're more financial oriented uh, team uh, so they have their they have their specialty towards that and they might not see from a value standpoint so either ask your cfo uh, or a team to carve out a, a small a small team to get this work done from an unbiased standpoint where the management itself is having a close look it's not a just a make a checker policy that happens 
uh, during every transaction. It's a thorough check, like you know, the entire body diagnostics that you do uh, before actually going to the doctor and not be surprised that, oh, I have this. So have these signs in place and ensure that you have all of these covered. So next is the most, uh, what is what I would say is the most time consuming and a time constrained activity itself is the, is the whole execution part for it. So first thing is get your valuation numbers right, your projections right, your models should be spot on, your assumptions should be justifiable and your numbers should be actionable. So don't say that I will say I will grow 5%, 10% because industry is growing that way. If you are saying that if you're growing uh, even 50% the next year, if you have an actionable uh, plan to it, then that 50% is justifiable. Don't, because anybody seeing a number saying the industry is growing this way, I will be growing this way, will definitely uh, turn off the deal itself, right? So your execution plan should be clearly visible in the model, substantiate your valuation, stress test your model uh, with various scenarios. Like your base model can be one, and before and after can be uh, can can give you what what is the range on the upside and downside and expect. Uh, in fact, so and your collaterals. So your collaterals should mirror what uh, what you're what you're telling in the model, uh, and it also should add more about your value proposition that you bring into the table, and also go beyond that because this is an MA activity. You should ensure that uh, your deal. Uh, is also not only adding value to you, but also adding value to the person on the other side as well. So, uh, so this stitching a story with your financial model, your value proposition, and your future go-to-market strategy is is really like storyboarding. It's like telling a story to your uh, acquirer, and that should be done very uh, meticulously, right? So this is not your fundraise uh, kind of pitch where you say, "I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and this fun, something wonderful. I will take it from here to there." You should go beyond that to say, hey, this is how I will be valuable to you. I'm not uh, just saying that this is where you will be valuable to me. So again, positioning from strength or win-win is always great. Then the actual due diligence itself. Right? So this is the most time consuming. Sometimes uh, as small as small companies like uh, $10 million, we can do it in a month or month and a half. But sometimes due to lack of information available internally uh, and the lack of financial leadership, I would say, I would be blunt about that. Uh, they, the your accounting team do not, can only present facts of what happened uh, before, but you need to present information in a more smarter way. Like even if there is something uh, which is, let's say you're doing negative EBITDA this year, but let's say if your gross margin is improved significantly, or this is why you did uh, negative EBITDA this year and how it is actually building capacity for uh, once you scale. So presenting that in a more smarter way will give you a much more uh, uh, better position for the information to be consumed uh, because if you leave it open-ended then the information will be consumed as the perceiver wants to perceive it but you should be directing the communication from how you want to be uh, talking about then uh, so once you get through this you're pretty much you're almost there into uh, the deal itself where you sit on the negotiation table so it boils down to negotiation uh, end of the day so let me tell you, negotiation is, is not exactly uh, bargaining uh, sort uh, which happens on the negotiation table. A lot happens beyond that. It, it can define what are the scope of work that you need to be doing in the next six months, 12 months. What are the other conditions that the team would want to apply? Sometimes these conditions will be in the best uh, uh, interest of the acquirer, but it you can do uh, only so much with your uh, particular capabilities, right? So realigning these uh, expectations, uh, getting the valuation right, trying to meet a win-win scenario here as well, because definitely the number you give will definitely not be the number that you will be uh, signing a deal on. Then it will be based on what you are, uh, how you can negotiate, how the negotiator can places points to eliminate some of the negative impact that the other team is bringing on board. And ultimately it's an art. I would say it's not an exact science. It is definitely an art to, of negotiation. And having an external person here would, would greatly benefit you or having a sec, uh, because they provide you a second line of defense. Worst case, uh, they might just buy you some time and get back because they have done multiple uh, negotiation deals before and they would have done a lot of uh, such transactions in the past. But once you, uh, once you, uh, so they will know how to position your company, how to talk about, uh, how to take in any point, how to justify a particular point. Because when they are part of the due diligence team itself, they know every loophole that can possibly come up during negotiation and they have it covered. 
So, like I said, worst case, they will they will say that I'll just get back with the management and they'll tell you what the answer is about. So it gives you ample time uh, and uh, best probability in order to get a good deal. So this is how an M&A can be planned and executed from both buy side and sell side to it. Uh, the last thing that I would want to cover is uh, how how can you improve your M&A itself, right? So are you are you trying to? Sorry, one second. So, so there are two different aspects to it. One is, uh, one is obviously the pre-closure activities that you need to plan about, like having your, uh, having your expectation set right, the management vision aligned, because every every deal starts off with an intention to, uh, with a great intention from both sides. But as and when it goes uh, later into the deal, the visions get misaligned. The company is doing something else, and a lot of things go out of play. So like these, there are a lot of these activities uh, which uh, will impact the whole entire uh, entire deal itself. So if you have these uh, aspects covered, I'm sure I've touched upon a lot of these aspects while I'm explaining the other uh, part of the presentation. So uh, one of the other key element is uh, what I would say is poor representation itself. Like I said, uh, you, have, uh, you have information that is presented from an accounting standpoint and not from a value standpoint, then then M and A's will be perceived the way they want, and not not be beyond that. So uh, also lack of proper uh, proper reporting or proper supporting that is there. Uh, sometimes transparency itself is something which is uh, lacking because there will be some material information which will which we won't uh, be aware of while doing due diligence. But once uh, once it is through 80% or 90%, there is a material uh, information that comes to light that immediately lose trust in the in the other side, and the deal might come down, uh, might go out of the table. Uh, and post post closure, what we see most commonly across major deals across the world is that they had the best team executing the deal, they had the best uh, uh, like you know the roadmap built up, the best process, the seamless process, but once uh, what what they have failed to plan is the cultural fit itself so that that actually plays a huge role uh, if two management styles are very different and uh, it, it's a big challenge to get in line with both of these uh, visions then it will become obviously a cultural misfit and it can actually uh, instead of doing benefit to you it can actually break you can break the whole uh, momentum that you already have then post merger integration so like i said during negotiation there will be a lot of milestones set There'll be a lot of uh, decisions saying that, you know, let's say the, the founder has to be there in the company for the next three years and it should take an XYZ positions. So if, if these integrations are not planned out well and not clearly laid out in the whole deal itself, and you say that, hey, this is the valuation, let's let's uh, sign a deal, let's get into it tomorrow. So that all those uh, deals have happened uh, on the fly where a thorough diligence was not done, the, a clear plan was not laid out for post integration. So once the uh, merger happened and trying to integrate, they see a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, downside to it when the when they're executing the deal itself, right? And uh, one of the examples that I can bring about is when the company, uh, when our, one of our mandate actually uh, was through all of this rigorous process and the, also signed a deal, but just before the implementation started, uh, one of their biggest clients got dropped off. So there was a material change that happened, which that client almost generated thirty percent of the revenue, uh, but once when, that once that got dropped off, the deal was immediately pulled off. So, even material change, it's always great to mention these contingencies in in your uh, report itself while you're presenting it uh, as a value. So, have the entire package ready, and yeah, I think any of these uh, aspects, this is itself another hour of discussion that we can pick up on. But I just try to summarize. Uh, the smaller nitty gritties that you can uh, uh, that you can that we have come across of late. So yeah, the and that's a wrap. And I'm open to any questions for now. If there's time, yeah, obviously. Um, so Karan, there was a question from Jitin. Uh, he asked that is there traction in edtech area? Oh, definitely. So, like I said, one of the uh, Baijus, for all you know, uh, and, and I'll just give an example from an Indian standpoint, right? So, 
Baijus uh, and all, all other top five players itself, right? So these guys are actually dominating the tech scenario itself because we see great signs of consolidation in the industry. So recently, Baijus acquired Topper, Baijus acquired uh, Labinabs, a lot of other companies, and uh, and also there is a good amount of uh, of visibility that Baijus might go IPO this year. So that again is. Uh, left to speculation, but definitely edtech companies are uh, edtech companies are in uh, are showing great traction, simply because uh, one of the key examples that is is that now edtech companies have reached critical mass, so they would want to contain cost and optimize their operations. So they're looking to techno for technologies that can increase their dwell time, so they can spend less on customer acquisition. They're in, they're they're uh, constantly looking forward for interaction tools because what you see in edtech today interaction means more immersive and not interaction they might show some fancy graphics all around uh, the video but what they are looking for is how can we get people to interact more it's, it's similar to what facebook or uh, uh, instagram uh, does to us that how do we keep getting people back onto the platform so technology companies who can crack that definitely have great opportunity in the edtech space itself and top five companies are looking to consolidate. They're they're trying to scrape over the smaller ones because if you see the spread in terms of revenue itself, right? Let's say uh, Baijus is at uh, about two hundred million dollars in terms of top line. The fortieth position or the twentieth pos twentieth position is ten times uh, just ten percent of that. So the top the top guys uh, are trying to are trying to get best technology in, into their system so they can utilize it and exploit and beat the competition. So they are neck to neck uh, in the top five neck to neck in terms of competing for market share, and definitely there is huge uh, scope for uh, high tech uh, techn high tech uh, technology providers itself. Uh, I hope that answered uh, the question, Kanika. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if anyone has any more questions, please feel free to unmute and ask uh, or just put it in, in the chat box as well. Uh, hi, Karan, this is Jitin here. Hi, Jitin. Uh, thanks for your excellent presentation. It was really great listening to you. Uh, I had a question. Would you suggest some reading for understanding valuations, any uh, material, any websites, or any other resource you would suggest? Uh, for valuation, I would say is specifically tailored, uh, Jitin. So right. I'd say valuation is, is not just DCF today, right? So like, uh, if I may ask, which industry do you belong to? Education. Uh, ed tech or uh, just education? Uh, uh, actually, both. <laughs> there are two. One okay. is traditional education. I run a career counseling firm. Uh, we do study abroad. We work with schools in India and outside. And uh, second is the ed tech venture also. Okay. So uh, to answer your question, so uh, there's definitely a lot of material that is available online. Uh, to understand a lot of assumptions and everything, but I would say uh, valuation is more uh, specific because there is no quick get amount of what we do. There's always something you new know, different and different ways of valuing But just to give you a good head start, uh, there is there is a lot of reports released by Ashwat Damodaran. The report by Sorry, I I didn't get that clearly. Can you please repeat it? Yeah. yeah. So uh, there's there's a, so in terms of global relevance, right? So Ashwat yeah. Damod uses a lot of uh, Ashwat Damod is a Damodaran is an NYU Vernon Stewart um, professor. So he releases a lot of metrics about how different uh, companies are valued at different sectors. What are the multiples of uh, um, revenue based on EBITDA based on Aaron, your voice is getting a bit, uh, you know, unclear. 
Uh, but I got it, uh, Karan. I uh, thanks for writing it in the chat also. Thanks a lot. I I, I think that's what I was looking at. That how to initiate. Thank you. Yeah. And also uh, one more uh, one more report that I read recently was one of the report by uh, which which talks about how startup are uh, valuable. What are the different which components? One, sorry, uh, can you please write because the voice is breaking. Oh, thank you, thank you. So, uh, I mean, if you if you want more understanding about this, I will be, uh, I can give more specific uh, insights on how to be. I we can, as if we can connect it, connect later on. So, uh, like I said, the Ashwat Amodan gives from a more uh, global standpoint, and one of the reports that I came across recently was the Dubai report. You can refer any of these uh, for your uh, point to start up. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, I'll probably crystallize basics, put it down and with pen and paper and then get in touch with you. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, um, we can probably wrap up. Uh, thank you so much, Karan, for uh, you know hosting such an amazing session. And thank you, everyone, for uh, sticking on and asking questions. And uh, have a good day, everybody. Thank yeah. you. And, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Kanika and Rochelle. You guys have been really sweet over the last two weeks in terms of coordinating with me, trying to make sure that you know you squeeze in the session in my time. So uh, thanks a lot for the coordination itself. And once again, thanks all uh, to all the panelists, all the participants for the meeting uh, for the session. Uh, I've just dropped in my LinkedIn uh, uh, link on the chatbot uh, chat box. You feel free to reach out to me in case you have any specific uh, queries. Or you can just write to me at the my personal email ID. I'll be happy to address anything that you would require. Great. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Kanika. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.